1954. The world population is increasing, so we need to provide more food. But the land on which we grow our food is being used for other purposes. More housing, more industry, new roads. In this way, we destroy 20,000 hectares of soil every year in this country alone. So, farmers are trying to grow more food on less land. More and more animals are being reared indoors. And scientists have developed new types of cereal plants that produce more grain. Farms are getting larger, better mechanised, more efficient. But these improvements can't go on forever, and in parts of the country, the living soil is being damaged by all this intensive farming, and production has reached maximum. Now, one way to tackle this problem is to convert some of our non-productive areas into new farmland. If I'd been sitting here just a few years ago, I'd have probably been up to about me waste in water seawater because you see just a few years ago this was part of the wash now it's part of Lincolnshire and a very very fertile part all this land stretching almost as far as you can see has come from the North Sea the tides coming down the coast erode and scour away the land to the north and carry it in the form of particles suspended in the water now, this material settles down in the calm waters of the wash to form a thick layer of silt or mud. And this mud is horrible, slimy stuff. All the sand and clay particles are so small and there are no air spaces. There's no structure to the stuff, yet this is the basic ingredients needed to make a soil. Now, every time the tide comes in and water comes rushing up this creek, it brings with it a new um, burden of silt which will be laid down on these flats. But of course the trouble is if nothing else happens then it's just going to get washed back out the sea again with the tide. So plants and very, very highly adapted plants grow here and start to bind the silt together and hold it onto the banks. And one of these is this super thing, the glassworm. 
Now it's got to be a pretty switched on plant to be able to live here because it's got to be able to put up with all the salt that there is in the silt and of course the fact that there's absolutely no oxygen down there. And you can actually easily see that this one can put up with the salt here. If you chew it, it's in there, it tastes absolutely filthy. But once these very hardy plants can grow, they start to bind holding the silt together and begin this whole formation, the process of formation of soil. So it's this plant, the glasswort, that helps to stabilise the silt, allowing it to build up, making the habitat more inviting to other plants. The sea purslane, it too is able to tolerate the salty and waterlogged conditions. And so is the lovely sea lavender. And the sea aster, all these are highly specialised plants. You see, it's far too salty here for crop plants such as wheat, beans or potatoes to grow. We've got to get rid of the salt, and that means keeping out the tide. This bank is three metres above the marsh, and it was built 18 months ago and has kept out the salt water ever since. So once the bank was built, the next job to be done was to dig long, deep drains. And the function of these, well, to drain away the salt water and then to allow the rain falling on the surface to flush and dissolve away the salt. Now, by this time, you know, we really should have something that looks and feels like soil. So let's take a look. There we are, the bottom of the bank, we've still got the thick, gooey, horrible silt that starts the whole process off. But the process has been going on, and here we can see uh, lots and lots of little tiny cracks. It's drying out, and they run and they join up with the big crack, and the water goes straight throughout the bottom. And if we can get a lump of it off at the top, then the thing's already got structure. It isn't a structurally as goo. There's lots of nitty-gritty bits in it. And right at the top, well, there are the soil with the roots going down into it. And we've already got quite a lush vegetation consisting mainly of grasses. But if we look about, yeah, we can still find the original thing that started it all off, the glasswort. It doesn't look nearly as healthy as it did down there by the sea. And no, it doesn't taste nearly as salty. But it's no good me just saying to the farmer, oh, the plant don't taste as salty, you're OK. He's got to invest a lot more time and a lot more money in this. And before he does it, well, soil samples are going to be collected and they're going to be sent to the laboratory for some pretty delicate testing. And it's here that the samples of soil are tested for such things as how much organic matter they contain, what minerals are present, you know, calcium, sodium, potassium and phosphorus, and whether the soil is acid or alkaline. We can find out how acid or alkaline the soil may be, in other words, find out its pH, by first of all preparing a solution of the soil. To this measured quantity of soil, we add a specific volume of water. Now here it's all automated so that lots of samples can be done at the same time. And after the mixture's been well stirred up, then a special probe is lowered into the sample and the pH is measured automatically. If the result is under 7 on the dial, it's acid. Above 7, it's alkaline. 7.6, our sample's alkaline. Now, we can measure the amount of salt in a soil using a spectrophotometer. Since different substances burn with different coloured flames, then certain substances can be identified from the accurate measurement of the flame colour and its intensity. In this case, it's bright orange, indicating lots of sodium. So the farmer now knows that his soil is too, too salty for crop plants. But he also knows that it can be made to produce some food. Because, you see, the natural grass and salt marsh plants are excellent fodder for cattle and sheep. 
And while he's waiting for the rain to finish the job and flush out the salt, the farmer can get on and prepare the soil for his first food crop. the old creeks must first be filled in. The disc harrow is used to break up the hard, dry soil and mix in the plant material. And now the air and the rain can get in and continue their work. Normally, this takes a long time, being dependent on a whole host of tiny animals like insects and worms which live in the soil. The machine simply speeds up the process. Once the soil has been broken up, then grass seed can be sown. Grass produces lots of roots that improve the structure of the soil and they provide valuable organic material when they die. A final roll and it's all ready for the grass to come up. Now, this process is repeated for another five years, by which time most of the salt will have gone and the structure of the soil will be suitable for the first crop of potatoes. So that's what all the fuss is about. All this hard work has gone to produce a good, clummy soil. And by a crummy soil, we really do mean a good soil. This is some of the best soil in the British Isles. Clums, small crumbs, in between which there's plenty of air spaces, air spaces in which the roots can get down and in which a whole host of different soil animals can live. And perhaps most important of all, through which the soil water can percolate. So only seven years ago, this was covered with sea. But now we've got our first root crop spuds, 18 tonnes of them to the acre. That's almost a million bags of potato crisps. Productivity in the real sense of the word. But where's the salt gone? Well, it's out there, out in the sea, and it will stay there as long as the bank does. And as there's another bank just over there, which was built all round about Roman times, there should be no trouble at all. This Roman bank is still as good as new. It used to keep the sea out, but now it's 2,000 metres in land. And all the land you can see has been formed since then. And there's the latest bank. And down at the water's edge is our friend, the glasswort, still settling that horrible silt. Maybe by the end of the century, there'll be cabbages and spuds stretching, well, well out to sea. Not far inland is this flat, desolate moorland. No crops seem to grow here, suggesting that it must be unsuitable for farming. Well, so was the salt marsh. Let's see whether anything can be done to make this vast area productive. Oh, them's not potatoes, that's peat. Now, we all know what potatoes are, but exactly what is peat? Oh, peat's pure plant material, pure organic matter. There's no salt and there's no mineral matter in there at all. I mean, you easily prove it simply by chewing the stuff. No salt and, listen, there are no gritty bits. So it's pure plant material. Let's go and have a look how it's formed. Many thousands of years ago, there was a salt marsh here, and that natural process, you know, gradually sealed it off from the sea, and it turned into a shallow, stagnant lake. Now, the new plants growing in this lake, well, as it was stagnant, there was no oxygen, and when they died, they just couldn't decay, and they began slowly to form this stuff called peat. And through time, and it took an awful long time, it 
produced this layer of organic matter, you see, which has shut off all the effect of the salt marsh silt way down there underneath. And the real fascinating thing about this stuff is that as the plants haven't decayed, they still must be there. And we should be able to open this like really a history book, you see, and there are the remains of the plant still and the expert can look at them and he can tell that the same plants were growing thousands of years here ago here as a going here today because you see very very few plants can put up with this rather extreme habitat this rather extreme environment which is waterlogged there aren't very many minerals in fact the only minerals which ever get to the plants going on the surface come down in the rain and it is highly acid this portable pH meter will tell us just how acid the land is. You put the probe into the peat and read off the dial. It's dropping below seven. It's acid. That's very acid. So the land's acid, it's waterlogged, and there are practically no minerals present. So you see, there's an awful lot of it, not just this dirty great pile I'm standing on, but all that ground out there, square miles, covered with a nice thick layer of peat. Now, just imagine, say we could turn it into agricultural land. Well, think back to the silt and the salt marsh. If only we could bring that silt here and mix it up with the peat, we'd be there. And that's just what happened, because if we look over there, we can see that the whole of this had already been turned in to very, very good, highly productive soil. And the way they did it, well, this large ditch down at the bottom, it wasn't dug to drain the water out, but it was dug to bring the water in. And at high tide, the water came rushing up this ditch with its great load of silt, and it was allowed to spill over onto the peat. And as it did, of course, there it was, the silt, the peat mixed together, bingo, soil. But today, this method is uneconomic, and so some farmers are trying a different approach. First, the land is drained to reduce water logging. All the dense vegetation is then cleared, and the tree roots are dug up. The land is still acid, so the farmer spreads lime to neutralise it, and artificial fertiliser provides the minerals. And now cereals can be grown where crops have never grown before. But without inorganic materials such as silt to improve the soil structure, the land won't remain productive for long. However, if peat is uneconomic for farmers, it's big business for others. is left for several months to weather and to dry out. It's then collected together. The partially dried peat now goes to a factory where it will be shredded up and then all the minerals it lacks will be added. The peat is thus turned into compost, which is the best growing medium for many delicate plants. This compost is used extensively in horticulture. And these growing bags contain all a plant needs except water. Add water and it's ideal for growing tomatoes and lettuces. Here, in these vast greenhouses, we have scientifically controlled conditions, the ideal temperature and moisture content, the perfect growing environment. The result is more food, faster, 
Unfortunately, only a fraction of our food could be produced economically in this way. A barrow load of history. Yes, the peak can tell us what happened in the past, if only it could tell us what was going to happen in the future, because that's a real problem. You see, the supplies of peat lands and peat and salt marshes aren't limitless and we do need soil so perhaps what we really should be doing is looking after the soil that we've already got treating it like the living vital thing it is because it is vital to man's own survival